Hi, this is Roman Slavinsky. I'm the founder and owner of A Plus Tutoring. And in my episode on the growth, Business Growth Architect Show, I will share several tips on how to empower your child and to create a positive atmosphere for this school year to counteract COVID learning loss. Welcome back, everyone. This is your host, Piata Chalet. Today on our episode of the Business Growth Architect Show, we're going to be doing something a little bit different because today I have Roman Slavinsky with me. Roman, welcome to the show. Piata, thank you so much for having me. So you are not exactly like a business growth expert, but you are somebody who helps people who want to grow their business dramatically by doing something that all of us who are parents need to have. For those of us who don't know who you are, please go ahead and introduce yourself. My name is Roman Slavinsky. I'm the founder and owner of A Plus Tutoring. I am a private learning expert and I work directly with families of school-age children to help them become empowered within their education and to erase all COVID-related learning loss. So one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is that I was a single parent and I remember vividly how difficult it is when you are a working parent and then you have to stress out to make it to school on time. You got to pick up your kid. It's late. You have to do dinner. You have to make sure that they do homework. And I found that there's a lot of uh, problems that occur. Can you take us through some of these things that you see when you work with uh, kids and their parents of where things go wrong? Absolutely. So I'll give you an example. I spoke to a mom, we'll call her Mary, and she has a daughter that's in fourth grade. Well, just starting fourth grade this school year. And that means that when COVID hit, the daughter was in first grade. And now when I talk to her, she's really concerned because her daughter's starting off fourth grade. The teacher gave some expectations of what they're going to be learning and what's going to be expected of her child. She's like, oh my God, I feel like we're behind. And I don't even know where to start. So for situations like this, we really advise parents to stick to our PACE method, which is to pause, assess, create, and then empower. So the most important thing right now during the first week or two of the school year is to have a long and thorough talk with your child about what's working and what's not, and to really have all of the information that the teacher is providing accessible and have a clear understanding of what it means. So one of the things that I noticed, and maybe that's because I, I'm, I'm a type A personality, but I never had really the patience because I felt that my daughter should actually do the homework independently. I felt that that burden of checking on whether or not she does her homework shouldn't really exactly be on me. I mean, how do we get our, our children to have this work ethic of accountability for their own work because not everybody loves going to school especially when they are behind or when there's an issue they try to avoid it so what can you tell our listeners who are parents who are stressed out what is it that they should absolutely not be doing and what is the one thing that they need to do immediately to help their kids what a great question So let's start off first with the one thing that you should not be doing. You should not be doing your child's homework for them just to get it done. That means it's 8.30, you just finished dinner, bath time is already late, and the homework that you're looking at was not done completely and not done accurately. And so you're sitting there and guiding your child and telling them what to write. Learning is not happening there, and all you're doing is training your kids that mommy or daddy will come in and save the day and fix your problems if you can't do it on your own. So what I'm hearing you say is then that I'm actually, instead of helping my child, I'm hurting my child because now I'm I'm postponing their taking responsibility for their own actions. So does this mean that if my child has bad learning habits, I need to let them fail? Or what is it that I can do about it? Because I want to help them, Roman. I mean, I, you know, we, we all want to help our kids to succeed. And we are terrified of bad grades because that means bad grades. You don't get in the right schools. You don't get in the right schools. I mean, it's like this whole domino effect of 
disaster thinking in the in the minds of parents. So help us out with that. Yeah. So our first instinct as parents, when we're pushed into a situation where our kids need help, is to jump in and try to tell them how to solve the problem. When in reality, our kids are looking for us at us to actually show them how would we do this. So take some time out of your day, sit down with your child and break down their agenda and their calendar. This is what I would be doing at this time if I was you. Let's sit down and try to do this. Then break down. Here's the time when we have review. So really creating the space and the environment for your child to understand what has to happen. Due to COVID school closures, they really haven't had an opportunity to study in the same way. And they've had to redefine how they're productive. So is that like the number one strategy when you work with children and you help their parents as well that you recommend is the method on how we have to overcome our desire to be Mr. or Mrs. Fix-It and then instead position ourselves as a consultant almost is what I'm hearing you say. Is that the strategy? Correct. But in the educational world, a consultant is actually a teacher. It's the person that would look at how you're doing work and say, hey, have you ever thought about approaching this problem this way? What about if we switch this problem and it sounded that way? How would you approach it then? Really enabling and empowering the child to come to the decisions and to the realizations on their own. You know, I really like this because I remember very vividly and I don't think, you know, I was really great at it. I mean, if, I, if I'm really honest, I probably sucked. Uh, uh, a really bad at it. Full disclosure here, because in my world, you know, as a str strategic business consultant, stuff has to go really fast. So I don't have the patience. What would you say to somebody who, like me, is not exactly the patient kind? Well, that's where breathing really comes in. Very important. <laughs> Taking a, you just got to take a deep breath and understand just because I'm spending 30 minutes right now with my child and no work gets done doesn't mean that I'm not making an impact. Jumping into work right away isn't going to get the problem solved. It's just going to put a little Band-Aid on it till the next assignment. I really like that. I think that parents will uh, take a sigh of relief. That's a very powerful statement to say that we we still spend quality time helping our kids solve some of these issues or learning habits if we just spent the time to take them through the process without actually doing the work I that's a very powerful thing I never even thought about it like that so I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about what's being said in the media and in the reports can you tell our audience what are the numbers are they really as bad as anybody thinks and then if that is true, where do we start? So the numbers right now are really showing things that are bad with kids. And the social emotional part is the most concerning to me that kids are not being involved in outdoor and play activities. They're not being as involved in collaborative learning. And that really puts a lot of pressure on them to have to perform independently. And that's not something that will enable them to reach their full potential. So what are we going to do about it? Or how can, can, can we fix it? I mean, a lot of parents are very scared to send their kids to school. They're still worried about COVID. They're worried about that the kids have fallen behind. Give us some of the most common strategies that you help parents with to solve these issues yes. because you are, you run a tutoring company. So tell us how that actually works. So I would say right now, making a student take a test that is going to expose lots of gaps is not the right thing for us to do. We want to really focus on improving student confidence and building up the desire to go to school back to what it was pre COVID really focusing with the kids on the foundations. We can catch up as long as we look at it as a slow and steady process. You can catch up when you're building a house, but you have to make sure that the foundation is the most stable. Are you seeing that a lot, that there is um, fear of, of kids wanting 
to go to school that there is actually that that resistance that they don't even want to go to school is that what's happening there is definitely resistance of not wanting to go to school there's resistance and fear of doing things in a classroom setting one thing that we've noticed a lot and another parent that i talked to recently her name is cassandra her daughter is struggling with self-advocacy how do we get our child to feel comfortable asking a question in class how do we get a child to feel comfortable coming up to a teacher before class and saying miss so-and-so i really didn't understand the homework would you be able to go over it with me kids are just to not do something is just close the laptop but in reality in person that's where they're struggling like how to advocate and how to get that help you know i've never really heard anybody use the term self advocacy as you use it and when we did our pre-show conversation i was really intrigued about your concept of self advocacy will you share with us what does it mean and like what is it yeah so imagine it's the first day of school your child comes into class they sit down the first thing that they're looking at is who's sitting next to them what the other kids are doing and how they're behaving and then the teacher starts going over some material and goes over and says kids does anybody have any questions and then the teacher looks around the room and there's no hands up teacher goes are there any questions still no hands up the teacher doesn't know whether the students really understand the material or not if the teacher decides to give a quiz at that moment the kids will complain oh we didn't have a chance to study for this but how do we get the true meaningful learning to happen when kids see and learn from their mistakes being able to raise your hand and not feel embarrassed that somebody will say oh that's a stupid question oh there's johnny he's always asking questions to feel comfortable in their own skin the increase of confidence directly lowers their fear of failure well what you just described is really like what i see in business i mean if 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 i'm, if I'm going to build a bridge right now i think that the skill that you're talking about self advocacy is a life skill because we see this a lot when a companies are hiring team members and team members come in and they're embarrassed to ask a question because they feel that they are exposed in some sort of a way and then they do not know how to ask a question and they do terrible work i just had this instance you know this is a a story just that just happened last week so i recorded an entire audio course for a, a learning provider out of europe that goes into one of the largest learning development platforms for organizations and the person that i had spoken to had some health issues and so she finally left a year later and the woman that took over her job she says did you ever send us the files i said i sent the files a year ago so the woman had never admitted or asked for help you know based on what you just were yeah. saying all she would have needed to say is hey i'm having some health issues i have continuous absences i need somebody to help me just uploading these files so they in there so we lost an entire year um and nobody really knew about it and if we wouldn't have picked up the conversation i would have disliked the company i would have thought they're not doing their job uh they would have thought i'm a flaky uh a content provider because i didn't deliver the files where in fact it was somewhere completely different so having said that how do we how do we help our kids to get over the fear of embarrassment because i think that's a really real thing roman when i look at a you know somebody who's 6 years old or 10 years old or even a teenager the worst right being exposed that you're an idiot so how do we help them to not feel awkward about that well the best thing that i can share as an experience as a parent not even as a teacher would be to show your own vulnerability to kids talk to them about how you felt in school and when you asked questions and when you didn't how did it feel when you had an instance where you missed two weeks of school when you were sick or you had a broken bone somewhere i believe that the when sharing experiences and not just telling somebody what to do that's what resonates with the kids no matter at what age my daughter started first grade yesterday and the first conversation that her and i had 
was about how alone and scared I felt during my first day of first grade. She had a great first day and everything was wonderful, but I wanted her to have the true understanding of it's okay. If it feels that way, it gets better. But really knowing that they're not, alert, not alone. And another thing that, especially with asking questions in class, activities at home, uh, which can get fun and very entertaining, where a parent pretends that they're a teacher, and the child role plays. And if you have younger siblings, that makes it a lot more fun. I like that a lot. So basically, you know, I'm hearing you say this again and again is communication, and it's a certain level of honesty from parents and experience shares where we, where we as parents really go in and we tell the truth. We don't try to whitewash it. I mean, my mother is very old school. So when I went to school, my mother always told me, the parents has, the teacher has the power. So you better watch out because if you mess up your relationship with a, with a teacher, you're in big trouble. She always looked at teachers like as these high powered authority figures that had all the power and I didn't have any. So if we by any chance would have a listener or two that that kind of believe that, what would you tell them? And so, you were you were a teacher yeah. yourself, right? So go ahead, tell us. So my personal belief on teaching, and I know a lot of my peers that are educators are the same way, we look at things as a round table. There's no sides. The parent, the teacher, all other school personnel, grandparents, everybody that's involved is all at that table. And our goal is to do what's in the child's best interest. No two kids learn the same way. And no two kids have had the same experiences. So if you can share things with your child's teacher about what's worked and not worked with your child, you're saving a teacher a lot of guesswork. And most likely you'll get to the results a lot quicker. So it takes a village is what I'm hearing you say uh, to really have these conversations and the honesty and then assume that the teacher is a partner and that the teacher has an interest in helping your child. I mean, the other thing we hear, I think, a lot is that certain teachers, you know, as they get older, they might be looking more into retirement. They might not be as engaged. So teachers do also have different styles of teaching. So what is there? Is there a tip you can give us if we have some challenges with one teacher over another that will make us feel not powerless? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I can tell you is that there's different personalities out there in the world and chances are your child will have some experiences with some extraordinary teachers and some teachers that probably are looking at the calendar and seeing when's the retirement party happening. But the most important thing to do is to have your child be that child and teachers became teachers for a reason to want to help kids. So Sometimes you'll have to do a little bit of extra work to prove to the teacher that you're really committed and you're not just that student that's looking out the window. Ex communicate, explain the reason. Like, I didn't do the homework here because my little sister was sick and we spent the evening in urgent care. I didn't do the homework because I was busy with something and be honest about it. Owning up, I think, is a great lesson that kids have not experienced as much because in the public school system, teachers have so many kids. Most of the time, they just take the student's word on it. And teachers are the first people that kids lie to. It's yeah. the easiest. Well, anything to get out of uh, getting a bad grade or getting a missing assignment mark. I mean, yes. I mean, I think we've all been there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> At least one. Exactly. At least once. Talk to me a little bit about, so if somebody now says, okay, so I understand your tutoring company. I'm very intrigued with the self-advocacy. How does it work? So if I now have listened to this interview and I say, I think I, I like this approach of the communication, the self-advocacy, the listening, and taking sort of that stress out. How would we go about working with you? And, and is there a particular method or process to it? Absolutely. So the first thing that I would tell your listeners is go to our website, wetutoratthome.com slash success. And we have lots of free features and tips and tricks that parents can use to really set themselves up for success with their kids for this school year. 
Secondly, our process requires a lot of active listening to kids and to teachers. If you look at the letters and the papers that get sent home from the teacher in the first week of school, they're very indicative of what the whole school year is going to be like. Teachers are very much creatures of habit. And that's why it's important to pay attention because you can figure out ways how you can hack that teacher system. You'll know within the first month whether your teacher is going to give quizzes on Fridays and what they like to have turned in on Thursdays and in what color of a folder. And you'll get to see all their pet peeves right away. By being cognizant of that, we're able to mold ourselves to fit the requirements that the teacher's providing. And the most important part, it's either with the tutor or with the parent, it's showing the child how to study, what to do, and to share your experiences. And then afterwards, just sit back and watch your child grow. I love that. I, I wish somebody would have told me that there is a particular pattern a teacher has. I think that that's very empowering because we always said there's that uh, we don't know if, if there's a quiz uh, today or if we're being tested on something. But if you say, well, most teacher, most teachers are creatures of habit and they only do it on like every Thursday, every other Thursday. And I kind of can relax the other 13 days <laughs> and only only worry about the one Thursday. I wished I would have had that or thought about it or somebody would have told me. Um, very yeah, cause powerful. Because keep, keep in mind, when your child is going to third grade, it's their first time in third grade. For your child's teacher, it's probably their 21st time in third grade. That's true. So there's no secrecy for them. They know exactly how that system works. It's just that I don't know how their system works. So I need to figure this out with my kid together so that we can we can team up and be prepared for that. I really like that. So typically when somebody comes to you now and says, my, my kid's behind. So I looked at the statistics, Roman, and the statistics say that it is not uncommon to see an entire year of learning deficiency of where the kids should be and where the kids really are. So how do I know what the learning deficiency of my child actually really is? And then what do I do? So there's several different kinds of assessments that we can look at, some formative, some informal. But the most important thing that we want to do with kids is with math, making sure that they have a solid foundation to get them through algebra, which means fractions, decimals, percents, number sense, smaller numbers, larger numbers, and being really comfortable in handling them. Because everything that comes in math afterwards is solely based on that foundation. With English language arts, I would suggest starting off a writing journal. And the first writing assignment would be your child's baseline. You're going to watch and you see your child evolve and develop over time in the class. That's when you're cognizant of everything that's going on and you try to add more things into it. And so once I know the truth, so, so let's say I called you and you helped me to figure out where my kid is. And now I see that the reading is good, writing not so good. My child answers in a couple of words instead of a paragraph. And it's my child is supposed to like now answer in a more comprehensive way. Math is an absolute disaster. What comes next? Are you then custom tailoring a plan based up on that for my child? Absolutely. So we look at two things that, are, for, let's start off with math. So we're looking, is it the computational or is it the word problems? With word problems, a lot of times with kids, they know how to do the math. They're just having a hard time decoding the problem to know what is being asked of them and to properly recall the information that they know. So it's with repetition and practice, sharing like, this is how I knew that this is what I would have to do in this problem. Secondly, with the writing, it really comes down to utilizing different kinds of graphic organizers, whether on paper or on a computer. There's lots of cool apps and a regular post-it or a notebook paper is great as well. They're called thinking maps or graphic organizers. Really breaking down ideas and having a thorough conversation after your child reads something so that we know what they want to respond with and they have to plan their writing. It's not just taking a piece of paper and a pencil and 
getting down to it. It's not a text message. We want to make sure that our thoughts are organized. And those are the things that we're teaching the child. How to best prepare. What's your pre-writing ritual? I read something. I had questions that I asked about it. And then I went through and I formulated how my response is going to go. Now I can start writing. That's very powerful. And what do you say to a parents that are homeschooling that are not in the public school system or in the private school system? Does what you do work for them as well? Because I know that there's a lot of guilt for parents that are homeschooling because they think because they're homeschooling, they should, you know, they should have kids that really kind of know everything. Does this work for them as well? Absolutely. It works even better for homeschool kids because a lot of the programs require the kids to watch a video or a module and then right away jump into questions. That's very hard to do. Processing information after going through it once, kids are trying to get through it as fast as possible. We need some kind of a quality feedback mechanism where somebody asks, okay, so what happened here? Can you explain it to me? To show you those genuine steps, like I know what's going on here to allow for us to move forward. Otherwise, it kind of becomes like a glorified traffic school where they'll just click on the multiple choice questions till they get to the right answer. I got that. And do you have like uh, maybe a success story or two for us, uh, something that really warmed your heart away you went that that is why we do what we do? Absolutely. So we have this student, his name is Caden. He's in fifth grade right now. And when he was in second grade, school was just what totally upside down with COVID and he lost all interest in school. He would not have his camera turned on when Zoom class was happening. And what we discovered with him was that he just felt totally shy about saying anything in class. And he felt that everybody's eyes were on him. So what we did was we discovered that we're going to post a little photo of himself. And that's going to be on the camera screenshot. So it's not just a black screen. And we talked to the teacher about his concerns. And the teacher now sent him a private chat message letting him know, hey, Caden, I'm going to call on you in two minutes. By allowing the student to be a little bit more prepared, it boomed, his confidence boomed. Right away, raise hand feature is up, starts advocating for himself. And then when coming back home, finishing school, not really coming home. Yeah, going in the other room, going in the kitchen, right? <laughs> going, into, going onto the other screen to meet with the tutor, that sense of pride of, I was able to do this. This is what happened. Really got him to want to push forward. And we were able to have him in third grade when they did the gifted identification test, he actually placed into the highly gifted program. It wasn't because he was great at doing homework, but it was because he was confident he was in a position where he could thrive and show his ability. Oh, I really like that. So what, what I'm hearing you say again and again and again in our interview is that it really isn't this magic, massive, sonic boom that happens, but it is a series of small pieces. It's me on how I react. It is me how I do share what I have experienced. It's my encouragement. It's my involvement of my family. It's the constant reinforcement of positivity. And it's these small things of actually finding out what it is and not making any assumptions. Have I summed this up properly? Absolutely. And in a business world, it's your company culture. That's right. It's very much like a company culture. I love that. Thank you for that. <laughs> so we, we hooked it uh, kind of right back in there. So Roman, for somebody who wants to uh, get in touch with you and hire you and uh, have, have you help their family. Oh, one last question I wanted to ask you. Yeah. And, that, and I want you to answer this honestly to me how much do you think does this boycott a family life if a child has trouble in school like how big of a deal is it it's big enough of a deal that it keeps parents up at night and you'd be surprised at what time of day we get 
a large influx of submissions for people who want to ask questions about tutoring or talk about their child. It's typically after 10 p.m. When the kids are asleep and the parent is starting to think about what really happened at home, what led to the tears, what led to the conflict. Nobody wants to have a child that feels sad. You start blaming yourself. Parents always blame themselves. 100%. So let's give them your information so they can do something yeah. about it. Of course. Give us a call or a text, 818-850-6284, or check out our website, wetutoratome.com. Excellent. So thank you so much, Roman. This was an awesome interview about really what we did is we 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 gave parents a strategy so it fits right in a strategy in how to uh, have a peaceful home how to be an advocate how to help their child without taking over or fixing it so thank you so much for being here roman thank you so much for having me it's been great